week's night with two poets, each occupying a position of authority and respect within their own poetic communities, poetry communities rather. Um, they've both been garlanded with prizes. Fona Grork is uh, noted as um, an impeccable craftsman, uh, or I should say, uh, uh, yes, that's right. What, 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 what it makes to do is construct a sentence with the word craftsmanship. But <laughs> and somebody who writes from deep uh, within the Irish tradition. Um, history figures a lot in her work. Uh, doesn't dominate it entirely. And a uh, poet that seems to blend very well public themes with uh, personal themes. Um, Paisley Rechtal, each of her books to me is so different from the other, uh, but all consistent in, in their brilliance. Um, she, she's a poet who, for me, um, uh, fights out on the page uh, almost conflicting compulsions to uh, produce poems of narrative and poems of argument, and quite often successfully blends both elements together. Uh, both of the poets are poets who have read com or written complete books to a paradigm rather than uh, you know, a collection of loose, unconnected lyrics. And we're going to hear from Volga first. Hello. It's really nice to be here. Um, I think this is a really good festival, a really enjoyable festival, and I'm delighted to be a part of it. Okay, I'm going to um, start, I thought my first poem would be a long poem, words to strike joy into the breast of any poetry <laughs> audience, I know, but if I promise this will be the one and only long poem that I'll read, will you tolerate it? Okay, um, I wouldn't normally read it. But it was a request. Do you believe that? <laughs> but it's also topical because it's a poem about the Easter Rising of 1916. Um, and the whole point of the Rising was that it was a surprise. And if you're going to have a surprise Rising, then you're going to have some difficulty in providing for the people who take part in terms of food. You can't exactly be um, bringing supplies into your various garrisons or you run the risk of somebody saying, where are you going with all the stew? <laughs> <laughs> and the guns. <laughs> um, which might have had something to do with the fact that several of the centres uh, of the Rising, several of the buildings that were taken over were actually directly related to food. And this poem has seven stanzas, and uh, each of the stanzas is set in one of the, the headquarters of the, of the Rising, and is about food in the Rising. And it opens with a quote from Horrid Pierce, which he wrote during Easter week uh, from the GPO in a letter to his mother. And the quote goes like this, we have plenty of the best food, all the meals being as good as if served in a hotel. The dining room here is very comfortable. Which, even allowing for the fact that he was writing to his mother, I think is still a pretty extraordinary quote. Uh, lest you think I'm a terrible opportunist, I want to point out that I published this poem in a book in 2002, <laughs> which might just mean that I'm a very organized opportunist. <laughs> Imperial measure. The kitchens of the Metropole and Imperial Hotels yielded up to the Irish Republic their armory of fillet, brisket, flank. Though destined for more palatable tongues, it was pressed to service in an Irish stew and served on fine bone china with bread that turned to powder in their mouths. Brioche, artichokes, tomatoes tasted for the first time Staunch and sweet on Monday, but by Thursday they had overstretched to spill their livid plenitude 
on the fires of Sackville Street. A cow and her two calves were commandeered. One calf was killed, its harnessed blood clotting the morning like news that wasn't welcome when eventually it came. The women managed the blood into black puddings, washed down with milk from the cow in the yard, who smelt smoke on the wind and fire on the skin of her calf, whose fear they took for loss and fretted with her until daylight crept between crossfire and the sites of Marrowbone Lane. Brownies, simnel cake, biscuits slumped under royal icing, eclairs with their cream already turned, crackers, tons of them, the floor of Jacob's studded with crumbs so every footfall was a recoil from a gunshot across town and the flakes a constant needling in mouths already seared by the one drink, a gross or two of cooking chocolate stewed and taken without sweetener or milk. Its skin was riven every time the ladle dipped, but just as quickly it seized up again. Nellie Gifford magicked oatmeal and a half-crowned loaf to make porridge in a grate in the College of Surgeons, where drawings of field surgery had spilled from Ypres to drench in wounds the whitewashed walls of the lecture hall. When the porridge gave out, there was rice, a biscuit tin of it for 14 men, a ladleful each that scarcely knocked the corners off their undiminished appetites, their vast, undaunted thirst. The sacks of flour ballasting the garrison gave up their downy protest under fire. It might have been a fall of Easter snow sent to muffle the rifles or to deaden the aim. Every blow was a flurry that thickened the air of Boland's Mill, so breath was ghosted by its own white consequence. The men's clothes were talked with it, as though they were newborns, palmed and swathed, their foreheads kissed, their grip unclenched, their fists and arms first blessed and then made much of. The cellars of the forecourts were intact at the surrender but the hawk had been agitated and the Riesling set astir. For years, the wines were sullied with a leaden aftertaste, although the champagne had as full a throat as ever, and the spirits kept their heady confidence, for all the stockpiled bottles had chimed with every hit, and the calculating scales above it all had had the measure of nothing, or nothing if not smoke, and then wildfire. Okay, are we all set for Valentine's Day? <laughs> I thought I'd read some, uh, some love poems um, to get us in the mood, or else to give us a chance to reconsider and take to the hills. <laughs> There's still uh, just over an hour to do that. Um, so, uh, okay, I'm just going to read it, kind of a clutch of them. They're not poems I usually read, so I'm kind of taking a punt on them. Um, let's see how they sound. It might just be typical of me that when I say I'm going to read a love poem, that the first poem um, I read is called Ghost Poem. <laughs> oh, there we are, Ghost Poem. <coughs> Crowded at my window tonight, your ghosts will have nothing to speak of but love, though the long grass leading to my door is parted neither by you leaving nor by you coming here. The same ghosts keep in with my blood, the way a small name says itself over and over, so one minute is cavernous compared to the next. And I cannot locate words enough to tell you your wrist on my breast have the same two sounds to it. You are a sky over narrow water, and the ghosts at my window are a full day until I shed their loss. I want to tell you all their bone-white, straight-line prophecies, but the thought of you, this and every night, is your veins in silver point mapped on my skin, your life on mine, that I made up and lived inside as real. And I find I cannot speak of love, or any of its wind-torn ghosts to you, who promised warm sheets and a candle lit, but promised me in words. 
the road. There is a road a child could draw with charcoal or black crayon from one edge to another of a sheet of white. Any child could manage it. It does not have to be a happy child. That is a road I would find myself on, if only as a stone in the middle, the way love is, correct, plausible, willful, awfully sure of itself. High notes. On a train threading the eye of north, it is nothing to begin to collapse the various silence the city required of me, to find in the high notes of the brakes the, the scarlet lining of a dark coat or the single lit office on a top floor, to listen for the shape of a name through glass at a station stop, to observe the fields of an afternoon, the way they chase each other down in the kind of blue that learned abstraction moons ago how they resolve themselves into a love poem for no one in particular, written to be open for the sake of openness this night and every budding night inside. I'm reading these poems from my last book, which was called um, X, which came out two years ago. Um, X being in its various incarnations, both the letter of the alphabet and uh, a sign used by people who can't write otherwise, or it could be a mark, a kind of vote, or it can be a, a, a mark to signal incorrectness, or it could be also, of course, a kiss. The white year. I am told that memory can't afford to care less about what it brings to light. Just as I'm told, the table does not occupy itself with cleanliness, nor the made bed with desire. But it's difficult to believe. I do not imagine it's simple to strip from any given afternoon the intentions of the day. Not when a contingent darkness announces itself at the door like an ordinary to-do. And not when, in the winter garden, the beautifully managed trees toy with shadows of themselves. A skim of plausible survival settles on what I do while in the museum of the everyday no dust whatsoever is to be found on the bedside chair, unopened perfume, impeccable gold quilt. It may well be possible to separate into a fiction of forgetfulness the accomplished house, but I don't believe in it either. There is before and after, surely, and there is discretion to be accounted for, and grief, night after night, city after city, word after functional word. This is whatever time I have. My whole body has to find a way to be in possession of itself, like a shop selling only white things, or the way two bridges on the same river will have knowledge of each other. Um, I have a, a selected poems coming out next month which caused me to go back and look over um, the, the, the six books that I have and one of the, well sometimes it feels like a, a like an awful kind of process and sometimes it feels it, like, like you begin to notice the way poems kind of talk to each other across books and about how um, certain themes and preoccupations tend to, to preside throughout. So I had written all of these kind of poems, and I don't really call them love poems, they're poems about love in X, and then I went back and found um, this one in Spindrift, which was published in, in what, seven years ago. Um, and it's written in four little separate sections, and it's called Desire. I would like to feel indifferent as a plinth or tabletop of pure Carrara marble that has all its darkness corralled in veins that hold themselves instinctively intact. But his name is a coin flipped in a clearing at the dead centre of wherever I am. 
and the skin between his thigh and hip comes between me and sleep. I am long enough flirting with purchase and perch. I will set myself down, white feather, on the world's wide open palm. Okay. Um, there is a very rich tradition of um, poems with the title of the next one that I'm going to read. Um, and mine is just sort of tagging onto the, the, the tail end, if you like, of that tradition. It's in two parts and it's set around the winter solstice. Um, and maybe, even though it, it doesn't really relate to Newgrange, I think behind the poem, because sometimes this happens, as those of you who write will know, that there is a, a, a kind of a, a body of material behind the poem that doesn't make its way into the poem, but that's like a secret fund that the poem reads but never admits to reading. So um, behind this poem, I think, might, might just be um, the Neolithic tomb at, at Newgrange, um, which I've always considered to be the sexiest national monument in <laughs> Europe. <laughs> oh, bad winter solstice. One. The sun sidles left to right like a small child not yet learned to walk along rooftops one road over. Scarcely one full silence until it fulfills itself in the window frame and exceeds to a meaningless sky. My midland mind all flats and rim and barely a hill or a hillside there to prophesy tomorrow <coughs> struggles likewise with uprise. It wants to believe that a curious sun will turn its misgiven questions on their heads. But by 11, nothing has changed except that morning has yet to release each and every promise from my white bed. Where I would take you, given the chance, ask you to quote the first ripe hour between us. My nine o'clock lover, let your mouth be the small of winter, my tongue one word for light. Two. This morning I call up, sun through muslin, filling our names, so all our senses are fine gold wire, unspooling in our hands, and branches tip and only blue, in much the way your eyelashes do my breast, or your back is a scoop of decades linked by chorus and roof line. The sky is the soft of flesh of an hour, we skin with our teeth, and let to fill the rift between the rise of your mouth and my own. Seven times I listen to the knot of you come undone, the last one being upon your tongue a word no one has spoken or has any meaning for. Just exactly that kind of day. A summer Saturday pitched like a mansard roof made of red tiles, leftover minutes from the week just gone, squares of music rehearsing a fall as ticker tape from open windows, any street you care to cross. In such a come day, go day kind of town, I wonder what fractional slippage of love might think itself so obvious as this. And the wondering is like when something's lost, and you look everywhere, but it's not to be found, until there it is, right in front of your eyes, and still you keep on looking. Okay, and I'm going to read three more recent poems. Um, short poems. Um, one thing I always enjoy doing when I'm on the road, is going to vintage shops. It's a very good one in the English market. Um, and this one is called Vintage. Between trains, I kill an hour with 70s ceramic coffee pots and Scott Walker LPs, while Doris Day, in clip-on earrings, is innocent on a loop. I try on buttoned evening gloves and plunge my hand in mink. 
When did I start sleeping with the light on? Out on the headland from the train, a boat full of rain. I live in a flat that overlooks a, a big road, which um, in the morning and in the evening is full of, especially at this time of year, is full of, um, of cars. And in the evening, when it's dark, um, is full of tail lights, very pretty tail lights, when you can look at them from a distance. And a big advertising hoarding that flashes its messages on and off. Great Gatsby style ish. <laughs> the ad screen on the parkway. Every seven seconds, it flips over a new ad. The traffic blinks, and me sat at my desk. Well, I blink too. Enough to wish seven seconds were eight, and eight a whole hour, so I could put my glasses on, see the day come off its stilts, shuffle into the parked grey van and head on home. I didn't realise I'd become middle-aged until I wrote a poem about my dog. <laughs> <laughs> and just before I read it as it's my last poem, I'd just like to thank you again, um, Patrick, and for the invitation to come to the festival, and uh, thank you all for your patience and listening. This is a poem in two parts. This being still one. With the dog's head on my foot asleep, it seems wrong to move. She is getting old, doddery, walks into doors and stumbles off curves, feels her way by the edge of my voice. I have brought her to an island of cropped light and few words, her silence just as diffuse as my own. She keeps close into me. It is a small gift to the world, I reckon, this our being still. Two. In no time, at the clatter of a winter bird, or my book falling, or the heat kicking in, she will rise to the surface of the last of day, and I will meet her milky gaze to wonder what I wanted to begin with. Thank you very much. to hear so much wonderful poetry and to be introduced to writers that I did not know about beforehand um, and whose work I am going to pursue with a mad passion. I'm fully aware that I'm the only thing standing between us and the bar, <laughs> so I will be as quick, uh, dirty, and painless as possible. <laughs> Why some girls love horses. And then I thought, can I have more of this? Would it be possible for every day to be a greater awakening? More light, more light. Your face on the pillow with the sleep creases rudely fragmenting it. Hair so stiff from paint and sheetrock, it feels like the dirty short hank of mane I used to grab on Dandy's neck before he hauled me up and forward. White flanks flecked green with shit and the satin of his dander, the livingness the warmth of all that blood just under the skin and in the long, thick muscle of the neck. He was smarter than most of the children I went to school with. He knew how to stand with just the crescent of his hoof along a boot toe and press incrementally his whole weight down. The pain, so surprising when it came, its iron intention sheathed in stealth, the decisive, sudden twisting of his leg until the hoof pinned one's foot completely to the ground. We'd have to beat and beat him with a brush to push him off. That hot insistence with its large horse eye trained deliberately on us 
to watch. Like us, he knew how to announce through violence how he didn't hunger, didn't want, despite our practiced ministrations. Too young not to try to empathize with this cunning, this thing that was and was not human we must respect for itself and not our imagination of it. I loved him because I could not love him anymore in the ways I taught myself watching the slim bodies of teenagers guide their geldings and figure eights around the ring <clears throat> as if they were one body, one fluid motion of electric understanding I would never feel working its way through fingers to the bit. This thing had a name, a need, a personality. It possessed an indifference that gave me logic and a measure. I too might stop wanting the hand placed on back or shoulder <clears throat> and never feel the desired response. I love the horse for the pain it could imagine and inflict on me. The sudden jerking of head away from halter, the tentative nose inspecting first before it might decide to relent and eat. I loved what was not slave or instinct, that when you turn to me, it is a choice. It is always a choice to imagine pleasure might be blended, one warmth bleeding into another as the future bleeds into the past, more light more light, your hand against my shoulder, the image of the one who taught me disobedience is the first right of being alive. <clears throat> the wolves. It was the week of asking, asking to watch her eat asking if she understood the doctor's questions, asking her to explain the difference again between wanting to die right now and dying later, the tumor making certain answers unquestionable. I watched her point to the incense dish from which someone swept all the ashes up, asking if she recognized us, because that is what the living want thinking it is a sign we have been loved. But the answer was a summer drive, a mountain, piles of leaves beneath which a wolf slept, suckling her cubs. Some deaths are good, and it makes them hard to grieve. She was, at times, in great pain. We wanted her to die, too. That was important. But first, we wanted her to remember. From the bed, a finger pressed into its pile of leaves, gray haunch, unmovable ashes. I didn't want to disturb their tableau, she told us, and drifted off. And we did not know the meaning behind this. The wolves must have looked so comfortable to her, wordless, and in this wordlessness, perfect. Did she want to go there, too? I could point to the image and say, my father must be in there, my uncle, or the wolf is you, you are still the mother, as if necessary to name that self at the end of its world. An animal cry memory. That was our selfishness, as death was hers. She insisted upon it, and why not? It was good for me to get a chance to know you, she said, who had known me my entire life. Then the pills, a small handful, crushed into juice. She was happy then. We all were, or said we were. What is the difference now? <coughs> the cry. A man can cry all night, your back shaking against me as your mother sleeps, hooked to the drip to clear her kidneys from their muck of sleeping pills. Each one white as the snapper's belly, I once watched a man gut by the ice bins in his truck, its last bubbling grunt cleaved in two with a knife. The way my uncle's rabbit growled in its cage, screamed so like a child that when I woke the night a fox chewed through the wires to reach it, I thought it was my own voice frozen in the yard. And then the fox, trapped later by a neighbor who thrashed and barked, as did the crows that came for its eyes, 
the sound of one animal's pain setting off a chain in so many others until each cry dissolves into the next grown louder. Even if I were blind, I would know night by the noise it made, our groaning bed, the mewling staircase, drapes that scrape against glass panes behind which stars rise, blue and silence. But not even the stars are silent. Their pale waves keen through space, the way my father's disappointment sags at my cheek and his brother's angers whiten his temple. And these are your mother's shoulders shaking in my arms tonight, her thin breath that drags at our window where coyotes cry, one calling to the next, calling to the next, their tender throats tipped back to the sky. <coughs> I'm going to change direction because this is getting dark. Um, <laughs> darker, darker, darker. Um, these poems, I, I almost hesitate to read them. I uh, was writing sonnets for a really long time for this new book that will be coming out in October. And the first series of sonnets is a crown of sonnets to Mae West. And um, the reason I hesitate to read it is that actually increasingly people don't know who Mae West is. Um, and I hear by your cries of dismay, which I cannot see, but I'm very comforted by those cries of dismay. Because, uh, I would, grew up obsessed with Mae West, and what's really odd about it is that uh, I don't, I, it's like I came out of the womb doing Mae West impressions. And I don't know where I saw my first image of Mae West, or what film, or whatever, but I just knew Mae West was my star. And, um, but in America, you know, I, I mentioned Mae West, and everyone looks kind of Novocaine, like no one under the age of like 35 has ever heard of her, or Cary Grant. <laughs> and, and I hate them. And, and, and so I don't know what to say about this besides, God damn it. Um, and anyway, so the, the, the poems. I'm going to read three poems uh, from the sonnet sequence, and the only thing you need to know besides that they're sonnets um, is that she had a lot of very funny, kind of playful one-liners, of course, and so I wanted to do some sort of justice and honor to that. So a couple of the sonnets, two of which we'll hear tonight, can only are, are anagrams of her famous one-liners. And uh, one takes a famous one-liner, and the words can in the sonnet can only use the letters that appear in those words. So, May West, advice. Ban tobacco. Do bacon a bed, be delectable, collectible, a decent debacle. Decolleté, don't conceal, acne, do. Be bold and be toned, an octane blonde co-ed. Be colonel, not cadet, concede not at dock. Date a cad and canoodle, be a clat on a cot. Don't lean on a deacon, be adult a clone. Don't bet on an Eden, don't loot, don't loan. Be bell and ball too, a deb cocoa labeled. Be ocelot, be lancet, be candle and cabled. Canceled, debated, booed at to boot. Elect to be tall, don't tan, eat local. Be oded, caboodled, be beacon and left. Oh, don't be a noodle, be cool and collect. <laughs> um, this one is a bit body but you know, this is Mae West. <laughs> Confessional. The only good girl to ever make history was Betsy Ross, and she had to stitch up a flag to do it. That's the, that's the name. <laughs> what gal is safe from being slut, tether of lies that leash a pretty girl through life? Shamed in school by those who claimed we'd undone the captains of our football teams, shunned, despised, how like dogs we learned to heal. How we cringed and whined, how we pissed ourselves pretending to be good. Oh, but to insist beneath the artificial rules, a realer artifice named I might cry, one capable as may of jokes so bright they'd split the world to its brutal truth. It wasn't that we were vile, we weren't sluts enough. Reader, I should have taken that boy out back and fucked the life out of him. Forget it, I have another 40 years to go. I plan to be filthy. I plan to be low. Laugh, reader, so that I can last. I'm writing the story of a life. Listen, it's about a girl who lost her reputation and never missed it. <laughs> <laughs> and no one did. <laughs> Birthday poem. It is
is important to remember that you will die, lifting the fork with the sheep's brain lovingly speared on it to the mouth, the little piece smooth on the one side as a baby mouse pickled in wine, on the other, blood plush and intestinal atop its bed of lentils. The lentils were once picked over for stones in the fields of India, perhaps, the sun shining into tractor blades, slow moving as the swimmer's arms that pierce, then rise, then pierce again the cold water of this river outside your window called the heart or the breast even, but meaning something more than this, beyond the crudeness of flesh. The what is crude about flesh anyway, watching yourself every day lose another bit of luster. It is wrong to say one kind of beauty replaces another. Isn't it your heart, along with its breast muscles, that has started to weaken? Solace isn't possible for every loss, or why else should we clutch, stroke, grasp, love the little powers we once were born with? Perhaps the worst thing in the world would be to live forever. Otherwise, what would be the point of memory, without which we would have nothing to hurt or placate ourselves with later? Look, it is only getting worse from here on out. Thank God. Otherwise, the sun on this filthy river could never be as boring or as poignant. The sheep's brain trembling on the fork wouldn't seem once stung by the tang of grass, by the call of some body distant and beloved to it singing through the milk. The fork would be only a fork and not the cruel heft of it between your fingers, the scratch of lemon in the lentils, onions, parsley, slick with blood, food that, even as you lift it to your mouth, you never thought you'd eat, and do. Yes, the middle age poems. Um, this poem is taken, uh, it's an acrastic sort of poem. Uh, it responds to a gestural painting by Troy Passy. It's actually, a, he wrote in calligraphy a line by Edna St. Vincent Millay at a, at a widening or an ever tightening circle. And the line is the same title as the poem, which is, when it is over, it will be over. Hurricane of what must be only feeling. The painting's sentence circling to black on blank, ever tightening spiral of words collapsing to their true gesture, meaning what we read when not reading, as the canvas buckles in the damp, freckled, like the someone I once left sleeping in a hotel room to swim the coast's cold shoals, fine veils of sand kicked up by waves where I found myself enclosed in light, sudden, bright tunnel of minnows like scatterings of diamond, seed pearl whorled in the same thoughtless thought around me. One column of scale turning at a moment's decision, a gesture I was inside or out of, not touching but moving in accord with them. They would not wait for me, thickening, then breaking apart as I slid inside, reading me for threat or flight by the lift of my arm, as all they needed to know of me was in the movement, as all this sentence breaks down to O's and I's, the remnants of someone's desires or mine, so that no matter if I return to that cold coast, they will never be there. The minnows in their bright spiraling first through sight, then through memory, the barest shudderings of sense. O oh, and I parting the mouth with a cry that contains but doesn't need any meaning. I'm going to read a poem I haven't read actually in years, and it's from uh, my third collection. And this is another sort of word play kind of poem. I was raised by staunch atheists, but sent to Catholic school because they thought that was funny. Um, <laughs> uh, for years, I would go and you know sneak. I would do everything that all of the Catholic students would do. I mean, I took communion for years, not knowing it wasn't a snack. Um, I, 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 I even did confession. I mean, I didn't understand any part of it, and you know, it didn't help because I would go to school and I would come back, and my dad, who was a very very anti-religious um, person, he would say, what did you learn today? And I would 
would say, well, you know, virgin birth, and he'd say, oh, lies, filthy, filthy lies, <laughs> and then he'd send me back. Um, <laughs> for years this went on, and what this did, besides give me a major, you know, just fine for me the cognitive dissonance, is um, give me the desire to believe in God, but the inability to do so. And um, I was... You know, I'm a big fan of Gerard Manley Hopkins, and I wanted to write sort of an homage poem to him. Um, and these are, and his terrible sonnets. This is not a sonnet, but I wanted to play with his kind of rhythms. But then I also, um, you know, kind of wanted to go over the top with the kind of language. And so this is a poem to God, uh, but it's filled with Hopkins' kind of rhythms, but also malaprops that I was playing with at the same time. And I also think of this as a name poem, which you'll hear at the end. Um, something about my name. The poem is called Dear Lacuna, Dear Lard. I'm here, one fat cherry blossom blooming like a clod, one sad groat glazing, a needle peeling thread, so what, so sue me. These days, what else to do but leer at any boy with just the right hairline? Hey, I say, that's one tasty piece of nature. Tart darkling, if I could, I'd gin, I'd bargain, I'd take a little troll this moonlit night, let you radish me a while, let you gag and confound me. How much I've struggled with despising you, always, your false poppets, relentless distances. Yet plea bargaining and lack of conversation continue to make me your faithful indefile. I'm lonely. I've turned all rage to rag, all pratfalls fast to fatfalls for you, my farmer in the dwell. So struggle, strife, so strummy, to bell with these clucking mediocrities, these anxieties over such beings thirty, still smitten with this heaven never meant for, never heard from. You've said we're each pockmarked like a golf course with what can't be said of us, bread in us, isn't our tasty piece of nature. But I tell you, I've stars, I've true blue depths, have learned to use the loo, the crew, the whole slew of pill-popping devices without you, your intelligent and pitiless grays. Everyone knows love is just a euphemism for you failed me anyway. So screw me. Bartering yam, regardless of want, I'm nothing without scope, hope, nothing without your possibility. So let's laugh, like the thieves we are together, the sieves, you, my Janusgate, my Sigmund fraud, my crawling, crack-cray street sprawled out, revisible, spellbound. Hello, Joy, I'm thirsty, I'm pasty rectum. In your absence, I've learned to fill myself with starts. Here's my paters, here's my blue. I just wanted to write again and say how much I failed you. <laughs> um, two last poems. Uh, and uh, a lot of the poems in Animal Eye deal with animals. You know, I'm, I'm really original with my titles. And, uh, but where I've lived most of my life is the Pacific Northwest and the West of the United States. And all of us are touched by global warming. And in, in both large and horrific ways and also subtle ways that slowly become horrific. And one of the things that has happened in the West is that we are, we are deeply tied to water and water is evaporating and we're starting the water wars. And um, animals are feeling that. They're coming in, they're coming down from the canyons, they're moving into cities, they're coming into contact with humans and uh, are domesticated uh, animals in ways that they hadn't before. So though there's nothing overtly uh, about that necessarily in the poem, that is sort of the, the basis behind this. It's called A Small Soul Colored Thing. The dog walked out of the forest with the deer in its mouth. No. The deer came out of the forest. The dog ran beside it, over, under. The dog slipped itself into the animal lurching to my side of the road. One of its throats bent back to the sky. One of its spines dissolved to pear white belly. The throat was red, and the long legs looked broken. But I made a mistake. The legs were not broken. And the deer did not appear dead, though it must have been, animated by the dog's hunger, so that the deer moved when the dog did, shivered like the soul inside the body, the dog's face all red, which could be the color of the soul. The back of the dog was sleek and brown and expensive looking. When I stared at him, I could see the lawns he must have escaped from, 
the gravel drive winding down from the hills and the gold tags jangling at his chest, the clean, pink flaps of his ears flushed with cold. Now they were froth-covered, and his eyes were glazed with a furious longing. The dog tore at the deer's throat as if he could dig himself inside of it. The dog became a dog again, and I watched him do it, and the deer became something else. It left the soft ash shape of the doe grazing by the bus stop. It abandoned the buck's bright energy leaping over the stone wall that separates my house from the cemetery, its low border taut as a muscle that herds a deer trace in moonlight cast out of the canyons choked with snow. The deer became some shadow torn between us, beneath it the beautiful legs, the elegant ribs twisted into the road. I stopped and watched this wrestling, the dog half-deer, the deer half-dog, myself poised behind them so as to remain invisible, though a low, slow growl loosed itself at my approach. It entered the deer and reverberated there until its fur grew long and thicked, and its face took on the shape of a lion, a wolf, a bear. It became the shape of a mouth tearing and tearing as I watched it, wanting to take my share of it, kneeling at the walk and putting my mouth to the flesh, letting fur and blood both coat my tongue while my hands reached into the stomach to rip and empty it. I wanted to loose my gray hair out upon my shoulders, to feel antlers grow from bone, letting my own heart be pierced until the soft pulse shivered in the skin. No. The dog tore at the deer's throat, and I watched it. I was the human that could watch it. I was the small, soulful <coughs> thing that wouldn't change. The deer trembled and lay still. It grew slack in the deepening snow. The road disappeared, and the sky turned white. The snow piled up. It kept on falling. And this is the last poem, and I just want to thank you again. Mortal Love. If we were immortal, the poet said, like the Greek gods, love would not be needed because time ceases to matter. Love needs urgency to be felt at all. At which point, I left the hall, hurrying home to cook us dinner and change the sheets, to sit a moment and rest before you came back home to me, thinking all the time of the gods in our stories who, even with eternity to spare, loved, which brought them into the human realms of war and murder, the chaining of lesser beings in pits of flame, the skinning of rivals, and the creation of children sometimes beautiful, sometimes monstrous the need for the shapes and skins of animals to disguise their desires, meaning the gods knew guilt, too, and shame, and jealousy. They knew, as we tell ourselves, about all the human emotions in which love is rooted, self-love and love for spouses, daughters, sons, other people's wives, the love for ex-lovers, too, the secret old needs flamed out that the ashes nursed out of respect for the failure. The gods loved because we wanted them to be like us. No, it is not an excess of time that would keep them from feeling it. Love embroiders time, moving in and out of what we imagine of it, or what, if we were gods, we could finally know. For them, death is the thing that is expendable. Eternity means only that suffering can be withstood because it may be forgotten because we are the ones who must exist in the quick sharpening and dulling of whatever wounds assert us as human. If we are different from the gods, it is because we are more afraid, our sweet, dim, ordinary pleasures necessary to assuage what can't be forgotten, an instinct where theirs is an indulgence, and so our love is deeper, more frightening, more terrible than theirs. The gods loved, but they loved only as like us as they could. They could never match it. They would never match it. And it is because of all the things they loved, eternity would teach them to covet most their power and their will. We have these things too, in abundance, but not time. For love needs no time at all. Thank you.